G'day Fixers and welcome to another episode of Fivers. Today I've prepared you a tasty meal of workshop consumables. Okay, let's start with the absolute most basic thing that you're going to use in nearly every project, that is screws. There are heaps of different types and I can't cover them all. These are just the ones that I happen to have purchased and have on hand in the workshop. Let's start with the cheapest ones. I think this was about $10 or $15 from Audi for a thousand screws. It has these lovely little tubs and a really good selection of sizes. Bang for buck, especially if you're just starting out. Getting yourself a nice big kit of mixed length screws will mean that you can tackle just about any problem. That is an affordable way of getting started. The most common way of buying screws is probably going to the big box store and getting the little packets. I don't have any here because I stopped buying them because they're really expensive. Per screw, it's just stupid prices. So unless you need them specifically for a job and you know exactly how many you need, see if you can avoid doing that. It costs a bit more, but buying in bulk is by far and away a better way to go about it. Now these of course are the standard Phillips head type screws, by far and away here in Australia at least the most common. Uh, and I quite like these guys, not sponsored screws fasteners. And I bought 500 of 30, 40, 20, 50, 60 mil, basically all of my different lengths. And per screw, it works out a buttload cheaper. Now I just gotta build somewhere to store them more and keep them organized. But if you're in this for the long haul, buying screws in bulk is one of the biggest cost saving tips I can give you for your consumables. If you wanna get a little bit fancier, then these are square drive or Robertson head screws. They're a little bit more expensive. They're a little bit harder to find. Uh, screw it screws were kind enough to help me out with a project recently and they sent me this starter kit. And if I hadn't just bought several thousand of the Phillips head, I'd probably move over to Robertson because they just grip your driver much better. Otherwise, they're doing exactly the same job. You'll get them in a nice variety of lengths and you can apply them to any place you could use a Phillips head screw. It's literally just the type of driver that you use to put the screws in. Last but not least for screws today, I of course do a lot of pocket hole joinery and pocket holes require a special screw. You're gonna come unstuck if you try and use your regular type wood screws in pocket hole joinery. And of course, no surprise in the Fix It Fingers workshop that I'm stocked up on Craig screws, but there are other brands out there. Pocket hole screws come in a variety of lengths depending on your thickness, just like everything else. The big difference between them is, they have a nice, big, flat, almost washer-like head on them to pull the pocket hole joints together. So if you're gonna be doing that style of joinery, then I recommend getting yourself the proper screws. So there are a number of options for you for your primary fastening means when you're learning to do woodwork. If you like bits of metal in your joinery, something here is gonna help you out. Right, next up is probably the most traditionally associated fastener with woodworking, yet ironically in the modern day and age, at least in this workshop, doesn't get used that much. The humble nail. Now, everyone will have one of these, and if you're really lucky, you'll have one of these or something similar. I love my Brad Nailer, and because of that, I don't actually have many traditional nails. I don't even remember where I got them. Just like most people, I've got these little packs of random odds and ends of various sizes that I apply in very rare circumstances. Don't get me wrong, in some places a nail is better than a screw. And for some applications, a brad nailer is gonna help you speed up things like camping and making small jigs for the workshop, trim and finish, that sort of bizzo. Mostly I use screws, but when I do have to go to the nails, then brad nails are my next choice. These are just really generic brands available at most hardware stores. My particular nailer is only a finishing nailer, it's just a small one. It only goes from 15 to 35, so that's 3 8 up to an inch and a half of length. You can get much bigger ones, I don't have much need of them in my little workshop. But the humble nail is probably something that you should have on hand, because you never know when you're going to need one, even if you've already got the hammer. Number three on workshop consumables you should have stocked up in your shop is sandpaper. We need it on just about every single woodworking project and I use primarily a random orbital sander. There are tons of different sanding devices and if you have multiple devices, you're gonna need multiple types of multiple grits of sandpaper. Belt sanders, little palm mouse finishing sanders, the list goes on. 
but the principle is always the same. Low numbers are rough, high numbers are smooth. I suggest getting yourself at least three grits. Primarily, I use 80, 120, and 240. My next most popular would be 320. 80 is for moving the material, 120 is for general purpose sanding, getting rid of those harsh scratch marks, and honestly on workshop furniture, probably where I finish, 240 will give you a very respectable finish. If you wanna get really fancy, you can do 180 in between, and you could go up to 320, which generally I only use for in-between coats of finishing or on something that's gonna be really, really tactile. This is how I like to organize my sandpaper. I've got a whole video on how you can build a little sanding station just like this. And at the top, I have 400, 600, 800, 1000 grit. These I use for resin. If you are getting into resin work, you are gonna to need to go up into high grits. You can look at wet and dry, the list goes on again. You might have picked it. My favorite sandpaper is the Merca Abronet. It's not the cheapest, but just like the screws, buy in bulk. This Diablo net stuff that you can get from Bunnings is pretty darn good, but it's really expensive because it only comes in small packets. If you go to some sandpapering suppliers like Hammeroo, the Sandpaper Man, good Australian businesses, they're gonna give you a variety of different options for purchasing your sandpaper, lots of different brands to choose from, and importantly, bulk packs. Buy them in group of 50, yeah, you outlay more, but it brings down even <laughs> premium sandpaper to a much, much cheaper per disc cost. The thing to remember with sandpaper is that one machine is not gonna do everything. There will always be a time that you need to hand sand. Sheets of this come in very, very handy and they're super cheap too. A little sanding block such as this one is pretty much, I think, an essential to have in the workshop to complement whatever power sanding tools you happen to use. Number four, rags and paper. There's a few different types of things that I use and they're different qualities for different tasks. Recently, I've stepped up to what's probably your premium rags. These ones from Liberon, available at Carbotech, are great for fine finishing. They are lint free. They're not the cheapest, they're the most expensive thing on this table, but when doing waxes and hand oiling, French polishing, if you wanna get that fancy, then getting some lint free quality rags will actually make quite a difference. What I used to use, and still do for anything cheaper, are old gym socks, old tea towels, basically discarded material from upstairs in the home. And while these can be great, I sometimes find a bit of black gets left behind when you're applying the finish. So these more these days get used to clean up glue squeeze out and other things such as that. Having towels and stuff around for spills to quickly wipe up some turps that you've knocked over is also great. These little microfiber cloths, probably see the dust coming out of that. That's when you've done some sanding and you wanna make sure you've removed all of the very fine sand particles. They do wear out, but you can wash them quite a number of times. They are very, very handy to have around. The good old blue kitchen rag. I use these as glue cloths primarily, but also just for drying things, wiping stuff up. They are handy if you get the big rolls. They're also quite cheap too. They'll last you a fair while. And the other really good one, not really a rag, but again, stolen from the kitchen, baking paper. Putting this when you are doing your glue ups underneath, when I'm painting small objects, basically anytime you do not want to get a wet sticky stuff on a clean surface, baking paper is gonna be your best friend. Comes in very, very handy. Pick yourself up a roll, <laughs> and you'll find yourself reaching for it all the time. Last but not least, number five of this Fix-It Fingers fiber, adhesives. Cheekily snuck in some tape, we'll start with there. Bit of a theme with the rest of things. These are the tapes that I have on hand, although honestly, the clear packing tape, I'm gonna get rid of it because it's kinda crap. Blue tape, comes in lots of sizes. There's also the green frog tape too, which I think is a little bit more expensive. This painter's type paper tape is the one that you'll see used all the time. Making sandwiches with super glue and basically any form of masking off when you're doing painting, funnily enough, or getting glue away from places like the sides of joints, that's your number one friend. Double-sided carpet tape, I think this is the Bear brand from the big box store, not the cheapest sort of stuff, and I do now use the super glue with painter's tape method more often, but when you really need some good double grippy action, like I use my router sled, then double-sided tape is always gonna have a place in my workshop. I even occasionally find use for electrical tape, not as much, but handy to have on hand. All right, let's get rid of that. 
mostly of course adhesives we are talking about glue and in woodworking we are mostly talking about wood glue that is the YouTuber favorite and of course you'll see it all over the Americans type bond type one two type one three type one original all the different type bonds they're good stuff no they're not the cheapest yes they are fairly commonly available now and they're going to get you through the vast majority of your woodworking jobs it's a bit of a meme, but it is the industry standard, pretty much. It's a good product, don't be afraid of using it. However, in your big box store, you're going to get various grades and brands of your standard white PVA. I have found the added resins in the yellow wood glue, the tight bond, especially on hardwoods, does tend to work a little bit better, get different drying times and so on. These runny PVAs, they're a hell of a lot cheaper, but they will do the vast majority of your woodworking needs. So your choice of which one, it's your glue staple. Can't get past the PVA base glue. The specialty job. I have some spray adhesive. Mostly I use that when I'm templating out to do routing or something along those lines. For a temporary type fix, spray adhesive is great. Also, if you were sticking material to wood, then this sort of stuff can work too. Epoxy is super strong waterproof glue. So if it absolutely has to stick and it's gonna get wet, that's something to look at too. You want a cheaper version of epoxy to be used in similar circumstances, then these polyurethane based glues are pretty waterproof. They do make quite a mess. They expand as they dry. However, they can bond more surfaces, not just wood to wood, plastics, metals, and so on. Then of course we have the super glue. If you've watched any woodworking YouTube, you'll know that Starbond is currently the darling brand that is going around. And look, it's good stuff. I bought mine from Hamaru again, and it is convenient, the accelerators, but there are tons of different brands out there. Glue is pretty much glue. Like everything else, you get what you pay for. If you buy a really cheap watery PVA, it may not be as good as a branded one. If you get these crappy little 50 cent tubes, then that super glue will work, but isn't gonna be as nice to use as the more expensive branded type ones. And look, I was a skeptic about the accelerator, but I do actually like it. And I've started using it a little bit. I'll probably step up to a bigger bottle now that I've given it a try. Super glue for all those small fiddly jobs where you need instant action. The last one, not really a woodworking glue, but if you're into resin and if you're doing DIY handyman stuff, I always have some sealant, either the white stuff, which I'm currently out of, or the clear, just for those jobs where you wanna make air gaps, not gaps, or water gaps for your bathroom repairs and that. Not really woodworking, but I like to have some on hand just for that odd job. So there you go guys, they're the consumables which I've got in my workshop lying around and I recommend that you keep a good and varied supply of those on hand too because that will save you from having interruptions in your woodworking projects. The number one tip from all of this is buy in bulk if you can because they will become much, much cheaper. A bigger glue pot, a larger box of screws, a bigger packet of sandpaper and you're gonna be saving yourself a couple of pennies if you have the correct places to store them. Speaking of that, Better get to work on the next project. I'll catch you then. Fix the figures out.